Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual Grand Rounds. My name is Alan Wong. I am the president of the American Academy of De Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm so proud to, to have this uh, special event tonight as we close out December 2021. Uh, we have a wonderful program tonight. And uh, uh, on behalf of AADMD, we welcome every one of you. Uh, at the end, we'll probably have some questions as well. But uh, the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, we have three major prongs of our organization. That's advocacy, education, and access to care. And we're trying to promote that. And we very, very much are excited with our AADMT student chapters who are hosting this program for us tonight. And we have some wonderful speakers. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, in advance our wonderful panel, um, Dr. Bickle, Dr. Schuster, and uh, Dr. Harris. Um, this is a particular interest of mine because, uh, as I've mentioned many times before, I, I uh, sort of went through uh, COVID in a difficult situation, four weeks in ICU, and I was battling with it and almost was ventilated multiple times. And all that time, I'm thinking to myself, what are the lessons learned and what can we share with our friends with IDD and those with compromise? So um, hoping we can learn from this as we move forward and, and battle this uh, this terrible COVID situation and uh, lessons learned. So I'd like to turn this back over to our guest host tonight, Cindy Lee. And uh, thank you again, everyone for participating and uh, wishing you a great holiday season. Thank you, Dr. Cindy? Wong. Thank you. So hi everyone, welcome to our December virtual grand rounds. My name is Cindy Lee and I'm a fourth year dental student at University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in Philadelphia. This year's American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry Virtual Grand Rounds Facilitator. Like Dr. Wong just talked about, for those that are new, Virtual Grand Rounds are a webinar-based presentation model that creates a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge and experience between our IDD providers, entry-level clinicians, and future healthcare providers in training. The purpose of the Grand Round sessions is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across the spectrum of experience levels. So thank you guys all so much for joining us today. If you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, you may write your questions in the Q&A box on the sidebar. Any unanswered questions will be discussed at the end of our presentation. So please make sure to send any questions in the box and not the chat box. Now, I would like to introduce our VGR presentation and our speakers for tonight. We'll be discussing about pediatric cerebral palsy and IDD during the COVID-19 pandemic. First, we have Dr. Schuster, who was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and is a graduate of DePaul University. She obtained her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and her residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation was at the University of Louisville, and she completed her training fellowships in pediatric rehabilitation medicine at Texas Children's Hospital in association with Baylor College of Medicine. In addition to her experience in treating pediatric patients with complex and special health care needs, Dr. Schuster also has a particular interest in spasticity and dystonia management, traumatic brain injury, and has created a wonderful program for pediatric functional movement disorders in conjunction with child neurology. She also has a strong love for teaching and now serves as a residency program director for physical medicine and rehabilitation. So thank you for joining today for um, our panel. Next, we have Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris completed medical school at Washington University of St. Louis and her pediatrics residency at Northwestern University. She is currently an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Hospitalist Medicine at the University of Louisville Oaks School of Medicine. She's a medical director at the Home of the Innocents Pediatric Convalescent Center, which is a long-term care facility for medically complex children, and she serves as a board member for Special Olympics at Kentucky. So thank you, Dr. Harris. Lastly, we have Dr. Bickle. Dr. Bickel graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from Ohio State University, and he received his medical degree from the University of Louisville, where he also completed his pediatric residency and pulmonary fellowship. He also has special interests in environmental influences on asthma control, 
respiratory care for medically complex children, cystic fibrosis, and medical education. Dr. Bickle also has a published in multiple peer-reviewed journals on the clinical applications of impulse oscillometry, pediatric medical education, and barriers to adherence in asthma. And that being said, please welcome our VGR presenters for tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Schuster. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen here. And Unfortunately, this computer is so old that it won't let me do concurrent presentation mode. So I apologize. Um, are you guys seeing my slides? Okay, perfect. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, my role as a pediatric rehabilitation medicine physician and how uh, it affects our patient population with cerebral palsy and um, developmental uh, concerns specifically related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I, uh, this is a small portion of what I do, but it is one of the, I think, overall most rewarding. So a few objectives. Um, so I want to outline the role of the PM&R physician. Um, what, what, did, what is it that we do um, as PM&R physicians and specifically how we manage uh, patients with cerebral palsy? understand very basically the classifications of cerebral palsy and how uh, this can affect or change management of um, our patient population, and then specifically go into the effect of COVID-19 on the cerebral palsy patient population. So first, um, super, super easy, what is a PM&R physician? So um, there, there are lots of people who have no idea what I do, and I think sometimes um, I'm not even sure what I do every day, but there is an official definition. Um, so a PM&R physician is a physician that aims to enhance and restore functional ability and quality of life. Um, and one of the things that I really think that is the most, the most unique to our specialty is we are not focusing on a cure, but we are maximizing independence to improve the quality of life. And so every conversation that I have with my patients and their families, I'm really looking to define what that is for each patient and their family and what we can do minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour, week by week to build on that improvement in function, improving the independence for both the patient and because we're talking about pediatric patients, their families and their caregivers. And that is defined differently for every single patient, which is one of the things that I love so very much. Um, so as a physician, I work, as a PM&R physician, I work very closely with physical, occupational and speech therapy. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about how those are different because um, people get confused and they often will ask, am I the physical therapist or am I this, or how do I know what that person is doing for me? Um, and so uh, in terms of the differences between physical, occupational and speech therapy, um, you can think of it in a couple of ways. So physical therapy is generally addressing the upper body and occupational therapy is generally, I'm sorry, physical therapy is addressing the lower body and occupational therapy is the upper body. Um, but also physical therapy is thinking more about walking, gait, mobility, transfers. Occupational therapy is much more so on the activities of daily living um, and thinking about how do, you, how do you brush your teeth if your arms don't work the way that um, a typically developing child is. And so it's, it's very small things like that um, that we are talking about um, in the scope of patient, uh, patient care and patient needs. And then speech therapy has kind of a dual purpose. And so speech therapy can either be highlighted as speech like ST, like so PT, OT, or ST, or it can be SLP, which is speech language pathology. And they are addressing communication, cognition, and then also swallowing. Um, and then very briefly, because um, I know that Dr. Harris is gonna talk about this too. So what is cerebral palsy? Um, so this is a group of permanent disorders of the developing of the development of movement and posture that cause activity limitations that occur in the developing fetal or infant brain. And so depending on the literature source that you are looking at, this is going to be um, between uh, during gestation at the time of birth or between um, uh, up, to, up to age five, but generally we are thinking two or three. Um, the three major criteria for this is a neuromotor control deficit that alters movement or posture a static brain lesion, um, so it isn't changing, growing, worsening, um, and then acquisition of the brain injury, as I said, either before birth or in the first years of life. So the brain lesions themselves do not change, but the clinical picture of the child in front of you or the patient in front of you, the adult in front of you, 
can change with time as the affected individual grows and develops. And so I think that that's a really important point because the brain is going to look the same. The MRI is going to look the same. Whatever it is that happened is going to be there. But the way that the person grows and adapts can change. And so the clinical picture will change as the child grows, especially times of growth spurts are, can be very challenging. And so that um, affects our management and can change the way that we approach the patient at that time. Um, and so we're always adapting and growing. So then what are intellectual and developmental disabilities? And I took this directly from, um, I believe the WHO website as well, but this is a spectrum of differences that affects the individual's physical, intellectual, and emotional development. And so I thought that this was incredibly interesting because I never thought about this as cerebral palsy falling under the larger um, IDD umbrella. And I, and I thought that that was such a, such a fascinating, important thing for me to continue to keep in mind because um, by encompassing not only the physical and intellectual, which are things that I think about a lot, the emotional development is incredibly important. And as someone whose entire uh, physician job is function and quality of life, the emotional component is so important. Um, so it can impact many body systems and it present any time before age 18. Um, and not only impacting intellectual functioning, but adaptive behavior. And that's so much of what I do um, every day. So how can we make the adaptations to a patient's life to improve their uh, independence, mobility, whatever it is. Um, and so for example, under the umbrella of IDD, the nervous system can be um, affected, which is cerebral palsy. And so it just, I like that it comes full circle and really highlights for me all of the things that are so important as a physician. And so this is what I was looking for in this slide. So um, as IDD impacts physical development, cerebral palsy is a disorder of movement and posture that can impair that physical development. And then with my unique interest in training and optimizing the function to in the setting of these impairments to promote quality of life. So it all comes back together. And that um, is one of the most rewarding things of my, of my job. Um, so I want to highlight some of this with a little bit of uh, two patients because cerebral palsy, as I'm sure you're all aware, is incredibly diverse in terms of almost no impact on mobility and function to incredible impact on mobility and function. And I, and I know that we want to focus a little bit more on the more severe patients, but um, uh, th there is a wide spectrum within cerebral palsy. So we have two patients, um, a six-year-old male with history of 32-week prematurity, um, his MRI shows periventricular leukomalacia, which is scarring around the ventricles. Um, he has a mild delay in his global milestones, and he walks up on his toes with a crouch, so he's bent at his knees, and then he falls when he tries to run because um, his legs scissor. But he's otherwise healthy and really is interactive and wants to do things um, to be involved with the world. Um, then we have another six-year-old male who had a history of a traumatic birth. Uh, his MRI shows a diffuse hypoxic injury with all brain um, uh, parts of the brain affected. He's dependent for all of his care. He has severe spasticity across all of his extremities and has significant comorbidities, including seizures, neuromuscular scoliosis. He is tracheostomy dependent, uh, has a G-tube, so is G-tube dependent for all feeds, and has cortical visual impairment. So has a lot of challenges to interact with the environment. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about is we have two six-year-old boys who both have the definition of cerebral palsy, but how, do, how does my approach as a PMNR physician change? And so in looking at um, these two patients, the things that I'm asking myself are, what is the underlying cause? So why, why do they have this di these difficulties and challenges in their movement and posture? Um, what parts of the body are affected? And then what is the predominant movement pattern? And so outside of the scope of talking with you all in my brief time, um, there are three major criteria for classifying um, cerebral palsy in terms of defining a patient. And so just very briefly, I want to go through these things because this is how I think about every patient. So what is the movement, the, the type of movement problem? Are they too tight? Are they too loose? Are they having... Um, kind of ballistic type movements or dystonic posturing, which is a contraction, co-contraction of two muscles where you almost get stuck. And so we have patients that we take care of where the, every time they try to do something, their biceps and the, their triceps fire and they get stuck. Um, I'm sorry, my dog is sticking his head over the side of my screen. Um, and then we can talk about the anatomic distribution, which is um, uh, arms, legs, or one side, one arm and one leg. And then the function, which is where my, 
where I really want, um, where I really spend a lot of time um, thinking about. So there's five different classification functions. Dr. Harris is gonna go over this a little bit uh, more in detail, but they are one through five in terms of gross motor, manual, so like coordination, um, upper extremities, communication, and that includes both um, receptive and expressive language. So how well do you understand what I'm asking and how well can you communicate back to me what it is that you need? Um, the eating and drinking classification in terms of can you swallow safely? Do you have to have modifications to your diet or are you completely G-tube dependent? And then the visual function classification syndrome, which also discusses, which also encompasses visual abnormalities. Um, and so from normal, vis normal vision and no significant issues with your vision to cortical visual impairment, which is you have essentially limited or no ability to, um, to understand what is being taken in by your eyes and, and, and explain that as a meaningful image. Um, but for me, all four, five of these go back to function and quality of life. And by using these terminologies, I'm able to communicate clearly about my patients so that I can um, provide the best picture of what it is that I'm thinking and what it is that they might need. Within cerebral palsy, there are every body system can be affected, and the likelihood of other systems being affected um, increases with the severity of brain injury. There are studies that demonstrate that up to 100% of children have visual impairments, and that's across the spectrum from minor things like strabismus um, or astigmatism or esostropia to severe cortical visual impairment. Um, swallowing impairments, I apologize for the typo right there. I fixed it on a different slide. Um, and secretion management, which I know was one of the things that was very important to y'all um, from a dental standpoint, um, because secretion management can be a significant issue. And if you stop all salivary production, which we, we can do, that has a lot of impact on um, t uh, dental health. And as I'm sure you guys know, um, taking kids with special and complex healthcare needs to the dentist is no small feat. Um, then we can talk about cognitive issues with lower IQ and executive functioning impairments, um, seizures, epilepsy, and then nutritional def deficiencies and low bone mineral density. The list is much more extensive than this, but these are some of the common things that can really have a significant impact. So what can I do as a PMNR physician? Um, so I can work with the teams to talk about different therapies, so physical, occupational, and speech therapy, going back to that a little bit. Um, different modalities, which include um, kind of devices that will help promote function. Um, bracing, which I could talk about bracing for an entire day. There's entire courses about bracing. And so a brace can be helpful for a static position. It can be helped to improve function, or it can be helpful to um, encourage a specific movement pattern. Um, systemic medications can be used to help control the movement disorder, in which spasticity is the most common, um, but there are uh, and so using those medications to help control the movement, to make it easier for the child to, to do whatever it is or accomplish the task or reach that goal. Uh, focal chemo denervation, which would be botulinum toxin, um, which is an injection into the muscle of uh, most uh, highest degree of spasticity. Um, and then making sure that we are screening these children for all of the other uh, comorbidities that can occur. Um, a lot of times we do end up as... Um, I'm certainly not a primary care physician. I do not have the expertise that Dr. Harris has, but we, we do end up as a very uh, a common touch point for these patients. And so making sure that we are um, looking at all of these things that can happen. And as I talk to my residents, patients with um, cerebral palsy grow up and they become adults with cerebral palsy. And when you're an adult, you have to have all of those screening things. And so you have to feel comfortable with all of that stuff, even when you have all of these other medical conditions. Um, having close relationships with our surgeons and other specialists to make sure that we are directing our patients to the right location. And then a lot of times I, we have um, discussions about prognosis. Um, again, really outside the scope of everything that we could talk about, but the thing that I am asked about the most commonly is, um, it, will my child walk? And so this has been studied extensively and the best predictors for eventual, for eventual ambulation um, are related to the absence of primitive reflexes. So those reflexes have gone away. Um, and your gross motor development as it relates to being able to sit by age two. And so a patient who can sit independently by age two has a much higher chance of achieving some type of ambulation. 
but that doesn't mean ambulation in a typical fashion necessarily. That just means that they will have the ability to be upward, upright mobile with possibly a device. And then the type of cerebral palsy. Obviously, the more common, the or, I'm sorry, the more severe the cerebral palsy, the less uh, chance there is of achieving ambulation. In terms of type of CP, the hemiparetic CP, which is one arm and one leg, has the best chance, uh, followed by diplegic, which is both legs, and then quadriplegic, which is all four extremities are affected. Um, and then so to wrap up my, um, uh, my section here, in terms of COVID and cerebral palsy. So this was, a, this was a, an extensive discussion within the pediatric rehab community, because um, when everything Especially when, especially when everything was closed, therapy was closed, physician visits were closed. It's really hard to assess um, motor control via virtual visit. Botox injections were canceled. Elective procedures for bone derotations and tendon like things were canceled. And so, how does that impact your patients? And so, there was a demonstrable decline in motor function. When I finally was seeing my patients again, parents are like, they aren't doing this again like they used to. And it doesn't mean that their cerebral palsy changed or they had a regression. It just meant that they weren't able to get the services that they needed. And so they lost those skills. Um, they lost their routine. I had patient, I had parents calling who were saying, my child is, there's something wrong. They're not acting like my child. And it's because they weren't able to do and see and be a part of all of their general routines. Um, so they weren't going to school, they weren't interactive in the community in the way that they were before. Probably the biggest topic that we talked about as a peds rehab group was, um, should we, can we safely do Botox, the chemo denervation, the botulinum toxin injections? And so uh, there was a consensus statement that was put out that um, felt that it was it was safe to do both the chemo denervation procedures even during um, the pandemic. Certainly not on an actively infected child. You wouldn't do that anyway, um, but it was safe to continue to offer that. Um, our patients had decreased access to getting equipment, so equipment repairs were challenging. New equipment was challenging. And then there were a number of studies that specifically noted um, a negative impact, both on the patient, as we kind of talked about, they couldn't get the things that they needed. They couldn't see the specialists and the support services that they needed, but it also impacted the well-being of the family because the family unit was so, um, was, was kind of left to deal with things that they, without the supports that were typically there. And so that, that is honestly still something I think we're coming back from in terms of catching up with all the things that our patients were not able to get and are still struggling to get because of you know, supply chain issues and all of that. Um, and so those are some of the things that we specifically have seen as it relates to our um, cerebral palsy patients. Um, now that they are able to go back to school here in Kentucky, I know it's different everywhere in the country, but uh, going back to school was probably the biggest improvement that we saw um, for the families that uh, made that choice for their, for their children. So, um, and that, uh, I know I said a lot and I talked really fast and I apologize again for my um, computer from I think 2007. So um, I am done and I will turn it over to Dr. Harris. Thank you. That was great. Share my screen. Okay. Um, today, I'm going to cover an overview of CP risk factors, some common comorbidities. I'm going to introduce you to the Home of the Innocence Pediatric Convalescent Center, where Dr. Schuster, Dr. Bickel, and I care for medically complex children. And I'll discuss some inherent biases and challenges of caring for patient with patients with disabilities, including intersectionality, diagnostic overshadowing, and ableism. Pediatric healthcare providers will encounter children with CP in, their, CP in their practices. Cerebral palsy describes the most common physical disability in childhood and occurs in one in 500 live births in high-income countries. This amounts to over 500,000 children currently diagnosed in the United States. The etiology of cerebral palsy is complex as a number of factors can cause damage to the brain as a, at an early stage of development. These risk factors fall into specific categories, including 
preconception, which concern the broadly defined health and living conditions of the mother, such as low socioeconomic status, a history of miscarriages, or use of assisted reproduction. Prenatal factors, which are related to the course of the pregnancy, such as multiple births, substance use during pregnancy or prematurity. Perinatal factors, such as intrapartum anoxic brain injury or seizure activity, as well as risk factors in the neonatal and infant periods, such as infection or injury. It's important to remember that while the presence of these risk factors should heighten concern, half of infants eventually diagnosed with CP won't demonstrate any known risk factors. Comorbidities and functional, lim functional limitations are common and can be disabling. They often correlate with the severity of CP. Over 70% of patients with cerebral palsy will experience chronic pain during their lifetime. The star on this chart emphasizes the association of intellectual disability with cerebral palsy. 40 to 50% of CP patients have associated intellectual disability. And in 20% of these cases, the ID is severe. Other common comorbidities include epilepsy, musculoskeletal problems, such as hip dislocation or contractures, behavioral disorders, sleep disorders, functional blindness, and hearing impairment. As Dr. Schuster discussed, the severity of cerebral palsy really varies along a continuum. I think that the continuum of physical manifestations are well illustrated by pictures of the Gross Motor Function Classification System, or GMFCS. This scale uses a person's ability to perform movements such as sitting and walking and the use of mobility devices to classify the severity of CP, with level one being the least and five being the most severe. Starting with GMFCS level one as the most mild, these children can walk and climb stairs without a railing, but speed, balance, or coordination may be limited. Level two children are ambulatory, but require assistance with long distances or inclines. Level three children walk using a handheld mobility device and use a wheelchair if they have to travel longer distances. Level four children use a powered wheelchair for mobility in most settings. And level five kids are the most severely affected. They're transported by manual wheelchair in all settings and have little to no purposeful movement. As you would expect, there's a correlation between motor function and intellectual disability as the more severe the brain injury, the more likely there is to be an ID component. For example, one study of 107 children with CP showed that a majority of CP patients with mild to moderate intellectual disability are GMFCS 1 to 3, while 76% of study participants with severe ID are GM GMFCS level 5, experiencing more significant motor manifestations. Interestingly, 3.6 percent of study participants with no intellectual disability were classified as GMFCS5 with severe motor symptoms. This emphasizes the fact that depending on the severity and location of the brain injury, it's possible to have a severe, severe motor manifestations of this disease with normal intellect and vice versa. To demonstrate the spectrum of medical and psychological concerns that a patient with CP may experience on this slide, I'll review possible comorbidities in a little bit more depth, keeping in mind that the more severe the initial brain injury is, the more likely a person is to experience a number of these concerns. Half of all people with CP will have some form of visual impairment or even more per Dr. Schuster's presentation and prevalence increases with increasing severity of motor impairment. Hearing impairment occurs in at least one tenth of children with CP. Many children with CP experience concerns with speech and language, including speech intelligibility. A majority of patients with CP, depending on the level of disability, are involved with physical therapy in addition to orthopedics and physical medicine and rehabilitation for musculoskeletal concerns. Children with CP have potential for eating, drinking, and swallowing difficulties. Therefore, it's important to continually assess oral motor skills choking with eating or drinking and histories of pneumonias. A subgroup of children with CP are at high risk for low bone density. If they're non-ambulatory, have low body weight, or are on certain anticonvulsive medications, multiple factors may affect drooling in CP patients, including positioning, medications, acid reflux, dental issues, and low oral motor tone. Epilepsy occurs in one third of children with CP. 
Acid reflux disease and chronic constipation are common concerns due to poor gut motility. Learning disability or IQ below 70 occurs in about one in two kids and severe learning disability IQ below 50 occurs in one in four. Many patients will experience psychological, neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental or sensory disorders such as depression, ADHD, conduct or behavioral disorders. Most patients with CP will experience pain or discomfort during their life for multiple reasons, including spasticity, constipation, headaches, low back pain or UTI, among other causes. We typically begin planning and discussion of difficult, the difficult transition from pediatric to adult care at age 12 years. In addition to this transition, keep in mind that for patients with disabilities, any transition like a new school or a move is typically difficult due to multiple factors. Also patients with CP have unique social care needs which require attention to faci facilitate an independent and full life. As we discuss some ch children with CP experience significant motor limitations and comorbidities, while others very few, depending on the severity and location of their brain injury. I'd like to clarify two descriptive terms that you may come across for cerebral palsy and other pediatric patients with medical concerns, children with special health care needs and medical complexity. Children with special health care needs are defined as having or being at risk for having a chronic physical developmental, behavioral, or emotional condition that requires health and related services of a type or amount beyond that required by healthy children. This includes about 18% of the U.S. pediatric population, and all children with cerebral palsy and or intellectual disability fall into this category, regardless of disease severity. A subset of children with special health care needs caused by CP or any other severe medical conditions who have extensive healthcare utilization are medically complex. These children typically have one or more chronic health conditions with si significant morbidity and mortality. They experience many functional limitations impacting their ability to perform activities of daily living. They have high healthcare utilization patterns and are typically followed by three or more subspecialists, um, therapists or surgeons for care. They maintain a continuous dependence on technology to maintain quality of life. The medically complex child with cerebral palsy and severe ID or neurologic impairment is an at-risk population with significant care needs. At-home care has been shown to be cost-effective and positive for a child's development and emotional well-being, but is often difficult for families to maintain due to fatigue and stress for caring for the child, among other reasons. Also, a lack of community nursing availability can be a limiting factor for the care of a medically complex child in the home. For families unable to care for their child at home, a skilled nursing facility is an option. In Louisville, Dr. Schuster, Dr. Bickle, and I care for patients at one example, um, the Cozair Charities Pediatric Convalescent Center. Our facility provides 24-hour skilled nursing care to residents age of birth to 21 years, we have 76 residents, 14 of whom use a ventilator. Common diagnoses of our residents include cerebral palsy, global developmental delay. A majority of our patients have CP with severe intellectual disability, G2, musculoskeletal abnormalities, epilepsy, tracheostomy, ventilator dependence. Dr. Bickle will talk to you tonight regarding some challenges that COVID has presented to our facility over the past year. For the final section of my talk, I'd like to transition to discussion of an important topic, how we as healthcare providers, families, and society as a whole think about disability. This is especially important for caregivers because our attitudes about disability will directly influence the ideas and attitudes of our disabled patients and their families who look to us for guidance. To be able to address our inherent biases, it's important to actively think about them and understand why they exist. The Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems of discrimination and disadvantage. Looking at people through an intersectional lens, we see that everyone has their own unique experience of, of discrimination and oppression and we should consider everything and anything that could potentially marginalize people, including 
individual identity, such as disability, gender, or race, social determinants of health, such as housing, education, healthcare access, and societal attitudes or biases, and other forms of oppression, as people with disabilities tend to have less choice when it comes to social determinants of health. Diagnostic overshadowing is a form of discrimination or judgment bias where healthcare professionals mistakenly attribute clinical manifestations of a physical or mental health issues to a pre-existing condition. This can be the cause of significant delay in quality care for people with disabilities, particularly those with intellectual disability. To demonstrate, I'm gonna present two patient cases where diagnostic overshadowing by myself and my colleagues unfortunately resulted in delay of care. Um, I'm not happy, a little embarrassed by this, but would like to show you how easy it is to allow this to happen even when you know a patient very well and care for them. Our first patient, AW, is a 20-year-old male with a history of CD due to fetal alcohol syndrome. He has global developmental delay. He's nonverbal, but interactive and can follow simple commands. He has a history of severe behavioral concerns with multiple psychiatric diagnoses. He's followed regularly by our resident psychiatrist. He presents with worsening agitation for months. He, over those months, he returned to psychiatry for multiple visits, evaluations, had medication adjustments that were unsuccessful. We, as his physicians examined him, his, phys his physical exam was always normal. He then went for a routine dental evaluation, which is done every three to six months in our facility and had dental caries. His behavior was significantly improved after dental care. Our second patient, HS, is a nine-year-old boy with a history of Eagle Barrett syndrome, tracheostomy, and G-tube. He has mild intellectual de deficiency, dis bleh, a mild intellectual disability. He has an absence seizure disorder. Um, in his fourth grade special ed classroom, um, he had a long, really through all of his learning and, and schooling, he had a long-standing history of difficulty with focus and attention. Um, we thought it was from his absence seizures, but that per it persisted after his absence seizures were controlled with medications. Um, really throughout, we thought this inattentiveness, even after the absence seizures were controlled, was likely second to, to one of his medications. He's on multiple medications for his medical um, conditions um, or to his intellectual disability. A year later, his fifth grade teacher suggested evaluation for ADD, which was positive, and the use of Ritalin resulted in significant improvement in his attention and school performance. In both of these cases, we as physicians attribute the patients, attributed the patient's problems to a pre-existing condition. Um, diagnostic overshadow got, it overshadowing got in the way of making a more timely diagnosis. Ableism is defined as discrimination and oppression of disabled people or the societal belief that being able-bodied is normal and preferred or better. The case of Michael Dixon, who died last year from COVID-19, demonstrates an example. In 2017, Mr. Dixon suffered a cardiac arrest, which left him quadriplegic with intellectual disability. You may remember him from the news. His case sparked discussion within the disability and civil rights communities when he contacted, contracted COVID-19, his physician advised his family not to treat his infection and associated pneumonia aggressively. Mr. Dixon's wife who disagreed recorded her conversation with the physician who stated that Michael doesn't have a quality of life due to his disability. And that's why he was not going to pursue aggressive treatment. This brings up the topic of ableism and who defines a patient's quality of life. The World Health Organization states that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Interestingly, healthcare providers consistently rate the quality of life of their disabled patients worse than the patients themselves. The CDC states that what makes quality of life challenging to measure is that although the term quality of life has meaning for nearly everyone and every academic discipline, Individuals and groups can define it differently. It's important as healthcare providers to evaluate our own potential biases in terms of quality of life of patients. Mr. Dixon has five children, is married, is a college graduate. He can carry a conversation. His daughter turned 21 years old while he was hospitalized and he 
advised her not to drink. He was aware of his surroundings and his family. To you, quality of life may mean playing sports or participating in hobbies, but as healthcare workers, it's important to remind ourselves whose best interests we have in mind. Is it the patients or are we looking at cases through a biased lens? We have a duty to look at these complex cases through an intersectional lens without bias or ableism to the best of our ability. Well, for Man O'Connell, who's pictured here, he's an award-winning author and the Emmy-nominated writer and star of the Netflix series special. He also has cerebral palsy. Capitalism and ableism are like EFFs. Capitalism is sown into productivity and work, 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 push yourself to exhaustion. And that's tied into being able-bodied. Ableists portray disabled people as unproductive, making their existence a de facto threat to capitalism. That's ironic because disabled people are MacGyvering life to navigate a world that's not built for us. We're the most creative problem-solving people ever. Just because a patient may be limited in one area, behavioral or physical, they'll have skills and gifts in other areas. It's important for us as healthcare providers to be aware of where our biases may lie when defining a patient's potential capabilities or quality of life. Thank you for listening. And I'll now turn things over to Dr. Bickle for the final section of our talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. That was that, that was wonderful. Let me share my screen here. Um, and let's see here. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming out tonight and for inviting us to speak. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the topics that we've covered through a pulmonologist lens. And so um, we'll kind of touch upon what a pediatric pulmonologist does in the first place. Um, how we contribute to the care of children with cerebral palsy, and we'll look at uh, what impact COVID has had on um, uh, baseline respiratory health in children with uh, cerebral palsy. Pediatric pulmonology is an inspiring field. We help children every single day with inspiration and exhalation as well. Um, formally, um, the definition involves a medical doctor who has completed three years of pediatric residency and then does an additional three-year pulmonology fellowship uh, and then goes on to attain a uh, board certification. Uh, we uh, treat children um, with quite a wide variety of conditions, uh, including asthma, cystic fibrosis, evaluations for chronic cough are quite frequent, uh, difficulty breathing, um, difficulty with Daily life, such as sports, um, is, is frequent. We see children with recurrent pneumonia, apnea, uh, frequently chronic lung disease due to being born prematurely. Uh, we work with our ENT colleagues, our ear, nose, and throat colleagues quite a bit um, for the evaluation of children with quote unquote noisy breathing, uh, especially um, younger children. And then we see a subset of uh, medically complex children um, who oftentimes require special equipment to monitor or help with their breathing at home. Um, there's sometimes referred to as technology dependent children, children with tracheostomies, um, sometimes chronic mechanical ventilation, um, so on and so forth. Uh, most pediatric pulmonologists practice in, a, um, in an academic setting. There are some that are in um, uh, private practice. It, it, most are involved with, um, in addition to clinical work, some degree of teaching, uh, research to some extent, et cetera there's always something different um, going on. Um, the other thing that just for, for medical students to be aware of is that it's a little bit different from pulmonologists um, in the adult world. So pulmonologists in the adult world are also um, uh, critical care attendings. Uh, in, in, in the pediatric world, those are two separate entities. So uh, we are not uh, trained in, in to be critical care attendings. We do see consultations um, in all areas of the hospital and um, have a thriving um, outpatient practice as well. Um, in addition to very thorough histories and our trusty stethoscope, uh, we have a lot of um, different tools and therapies that we use to help manage, uh, evaluate and manage our patients. So we do uh, lung function testing with different devices. This is a spirometer that we use um, quite commonly in, um, in kids who are able to do it. Um, we have different devices to help uh, the delivery of medication into the lower airways where it can take effect and either help open up the airways or help reduce inflammation or swelling or maybe help um, to loosen up or clear secretions. 
Uh, there's also a number of our children who, for various reasons, um, need help with airway clearance. Maybe that is loosening secretions in the lower airways, as, as is being done with this uh, device, which is a vest that shakes that a lot of our children, say, with cystic fibrosis use, or many of our uh, children with CP as well, if they have um, recurrent pneumonias, uh, might use this. A lot of our children have uh, very weak coughs, uh, which can impair the clearance of secretions and uh, lead to high risk for pneumonia. And so we have devices that can help with that as well. Um, and in the most extreme cases, uh, our most fragile children um, will need um, uh, or benefit from home ventilation, which can be delivered either non-invasively through like a BiPAP interface if they just need it, say at night, um, or invasively with a, with a tracheostomy. And this is a child, you know, uh, uh, Getting back to what Dr. Harris and, and Dr. Schuster were talking about, um, you know, we work in a, a multidisciplinary setting to make sure that uh, these children have the highest quality of life possible. And so here's a little guy who was born prematurely, um, who is on a, who has a tracheostomy in place, is on a ventilator, um, but they're at home. He's with his sister. Um, you can find many examples of these children up and playing and, and being quite active, going to school, et cetera. Um, and so even our children who require, who require the most invasive of support, um, we work with families and with all the different caregivers um, and uh, to make sure that they uh, are able to lead their best life. Um, we do do procedures. We do flexible bronchoscopies as well, where we can actually look at the airways with, uh, with this device. Children um, are under general anesthesia for this. Um, this is, these are some pictures of a normal airway through a bronchoscope here at the vocal cords, trachea, carina, where we branch into left and right, and then the uh, peripheral airways. Contrast this to a child or a patient who um, has a mucus impaction for, for different reasons. Um, and we can um, use the, the bronchoscope to kind of wash and suction and remove these secretions. And so oftentimes this procedure can be both um, diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Um, and it can be done in the inpatient and outpatient setting. And occasionally we pull out uh, very significant um, uh, casts that can be obstructing the airway. This is something called plastic bronchitis. Uh, thankfully, not something we come across too much, but it makes for fairly dramatic pictures. The one thing that we can't really do too well with a flexible bronchoscope, um, just interestingly, is removing foreign bodies. Those are best done with a rigid bronchoscope that um, our surgical and ENT colleagues are able to do. Um, and so how does respiratory illness impact children with, uh, with cerebral palsy? So, you know, I think as we've talked about and, and as you've seen, you know, don't, no child uh, with cerebral palsy is like another. Everyone is unique and has um, their own set of particular um, issues in play. And, um, and the same goes for uh, respiratory issues that affect these children. Um, some children have recurrent issues of um, uh, mild illnesses where they need uh, repeated, say, courses of antibiotics or increased airway clearance or steroids or things like that. Um, some have a uh, slowly progressive disease. And then we have children who are winding up in the hospital quite frequently uh, with pneumonia and, um, and other uh, more severe illness. Um, respiratory disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality, as well as reduced quality of life indicators in people with cerebral palsy. Um, and um, obviously, as, as, as it makes sense, is worse in uh, patients with more severe conditions. Um, and compared to the general population, adults with cerebral palsy have a 14-fold risk of death from respiratory disease. And this is multifactorial in nature. So uh, many patients with cerebral palsy um, or who are medically complex, um, you know, might have things like scoliosis and um, poor tone and poor coordination. And all these things can... Um, create kind of a restrictive picture in a picture where secretions are not able to be well controlled. Um, and so this can lead to pooling of secretions. It can lead to inadequate clearance of secretions. Um, even in children who uh, maybe are being fed entirely by G-tube, they may still be aspirating on their upper airway secretions. And so determining those things um, can have an impact on how we treat these patients and try and prevent um, pneumonia and recurrent respiratory um, uh, issues. Uh, these children uh, might have, have asthma, as, as any other child might. 
um, that can further complicate matters. And oftentimes there are medications which can cause um, sedation that might increase secretions um, and uh, further suppress the respiratory drive or lead to other issues. Um, and so you can have an overlap of a parenchymal issue where it's the lung tissue itself that's infected, maybe due to uh, uh, poor secretion clearance, recurrent infections causing destruction of the tissue, um, and so on and so forth. You also might have issues with the respiratory pump itself, where you have poor uh, um, neuromuscular tone um, that leads to um, inadequate um, respiration and ventilation, and all of these can affect um, a child's respiration and put them at increased risk for uh, serious respiratory issues. You also have central drive mechanisms, um, and so some of these patients might be more prone to um, hypoventilation, where the drive itself to breathe is just not quite there, and so uh, there's different interventions we can take to support respiration. This is a child you can see who was um, hospitalized and is actually intubated. You can see the ET tube here on the x-ray uh, with a significant right lower lobe pneumonia due to aspiration. Um, aspiration can certainly present like this, but it can also be a uh, more indolent process where you have aspiration of small, low volume materials that create an, a chronic inflammatory state that sets up a uh, picture by which patients are more prone uh, to get really sick if they say get a virus on top of that or have other um, triggers for respiratory illness. And so how do we manage respiratory illness in, in these children? Well, we try and it's a multidisciplinary process where we're, where we're working with um, caregivers and other specialists to help address uh, all these different issues that we've discussed that can lead to um, respiratory issues. And um, so we want to uh, reduce inflammation, treat infection, overcome airway obstruction. Again, a lot of times upper airway obstruction in these patients can be quite, um, uh, uh, can create quite an impairment. Um, we want to support the respiratory drive. The other thing that's really important is preventative routine care, such as staying up to date on all vaccinations. And then routine oral and dental hygiene is, is extremely important. And there's actually a uh, paper that was published in pediatrics about two years ago uh, that looked at a large number of children, about uh, 3,600 children um, in California. And they looked at a number of different uh, interventions for trying to prevent pneumonia in children with neurologic impairment. And, and interestingly, the only thing that was conclusively shown to be associated with the decreased recurrence of severe pneumonia was routine dental care. Um, other strategies, such as gastrostomy tube placement, were associated with um, increased recurrences, although it's possible that there were confounders that um, this particular study was not able to pull out or identify. And so how has COVID impacted children with cerebral palsy? And so at the home of the innocents, with doc which Dr. Harris uh, spoke about earlier, strict infection control procedures were uh, put into place um, immediately, you know, very shortly after COVID was identified. And this led to a dramatic decrease um, in respiratory infections. Um, however, it was noted that we seem to be using more uh, respiratory therapies and interventions and that our patients in general seem to be having more symptoms. And so we wanted to look at this and see if we could figure out exactly what was going on. So we looked at a ret we, we looked retrospectively at billing data um, to look at the period between May and December of 2019, pre-COVID, and compare it to the post-COVID period. So what we saw was there is a significant uh, decline in the rate of respiratory pathogens that were identified at Home of the Innocents uh, during this time frame. But despite that, we were using uh, significantly more oxygen. We were using significantly more albuterol, which is a bronchodilator to help open up the airways. And we were using significantly more chest physiotherapy. All seemed to indicate that, that our patients were having more respiratory issues than they had been before, despite lower rates of infection. So we looked at this and we also then saw, well, look, our physical therapy and occupational therapy, as well as speech therapy, dramatically declined um, in the post-COVID period due to the protocols that were put in place and restrictions um, to try and prevent the spread of COVID. 
Um, and so we, we think that this decreased mobility, at least in part, led to the um, um, led to the need for more respiratory care in these patients. Um, the other thing that we have studied is um, COVID-19 vaccinations. This was very unique. Um, if you recall, you know, in January and February, it's a very limited population uh, that COVID vaccination was opened up to. And in fact, um, children at, uh, at this facility were among the first children outside of clinical trials, um, or the first, I guess, older teenagers and young adults um, to be given COVID vaccines. And, and the COVID uh, vaccine trials really did not include um, children with significant with severe CP and who were, would be considered medically complex. And so we collected data um, from Home of the Innocents on their experience with vaccinating these um, uh, uh, children and young adults um, who underwent vaccination between January and February of um, 2021. And reassuringly, we found that side effects were um, generally mild. 84% um, of patients had no side effects after the first dose, and about very close to three-fourths had no side effects after their second dose. And the side effects that they did experience were all uh, transient and, um, and mild. And so this at least provided a little bit of data um, to share with our families um, about the safety of um, vaccination in this, in this uh, population. Um, and so in summary, we, we, we found a suggestion that decreased mobility um, is likely associated with uh, increased respiratory symptoms. The data from our study is retrospective and observational in nature, and so it doesn't quite prove causation. Um, and while further research might be helpful, I, I think that it's just common sense that mobility should be prioritized in children with CP and um, who are medically complex uh, to support their overall health, including respiratory health. Um, and then from, again, the small sample size that we had, uh, COVID-19 vaccines appear well tolerated in this patient population. And um, COVID-19 vaccines, along with all other routine vaccinations, um, including the flu shot and everything like that, should be administered per, C per CDC guidelines, as well as uh, AAP guidelines. And so I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Um, and um, at this point, I think we're open to questions for, for any of the three of us. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys so much for the presentations. I think we have one question that I will read out. So we have a question from Claire and she says, um, any of you guys aware of resources or special specialists who might specialize in CP and aging. We're seeing more and more older people with CP and we're looking for information on what we can expect as they age. Um, you know, I can start. I, uh, I know that it's a transition of care from pediatric to adult care facilities is um, and physicians is a huge challenge um, and a big stress on this patient population. Um, and I know many of these patients are living longer than ever before. Um, I'm hoping that some programs to address um, medical school training of future physicians to better care for people with disabilities um, will help. Um, but I know it can be a challenge to find primary care physicians. Um, I know, uh, I mean, Dr. Schuster, you can probably speak to this. I know that some um, PM&R physicians seem to span the, you know, take care of patients across the lifespan. Um, and I don't know if a lot of adult CP patients are, are tied in with, with them and they could be a resource. So, uh, I mean, I can really only speak to what we do here in Louisville. Um, but I mean, to be a PM&R physician, pediatric PM&R is a part of, of that training. You, even if you aren't a pediatric PM&R physician and do the fellowship like I did, you have to have experience with pediatric PM&R as part of your residency. And so all of my residents um, have that experience. And so um, they can and should feel comfortable managing um, as, as these pediatric patients get older with, um, you know, when you turn 18, your cerebral palsy doesn't go away. Um, and so we tried, we try to, to continue to provide those care needs. Um, the problem is the, the primary care truly, because, 
I mean, we know some, but like when to order a routine colonoscopy, like I, I don't know. Um, but uh, so it's on the mobility side, on the PM&R side, we can do that, but it's, it's really all the other things. Um, as people age out of orthopedics, there aren't orthopedic surgeons who do these complex surgeries that um, our patients need on, on the adult side. And so um, those are some of the other challenges. Um, but Claire, if you want to develop that as your future career goal, you will be in high demand. <laughs> Great, thank you guys so much. Um, we can go back to Dr. Wong and um, make sure that uh, if he has a final say. He actually had to step out for a second. I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, he's back. Okay, he's back. I'm back. <laughs> hey, thank you for such great information. And, um, you know, uh, quite sobering but i had a a dmt I'm, I'm not sure if you covered this cindy did you cover this thing about sleep right no okay uh a dmt is focusing on some of the uh, uh health care disparities and we know that sleep disturbance is really major in our population and uh sleep is disturbance awareness not only sleep apnea but just not disturbance for idd populations can you comment on like pediatric cp with moderate severe idd and sleep disturbance, if polysomnography is a challenging uh, method to really diagnose, how do how are we gonna do this? And is there a surrogate test method uh, as we go forward? Because as you said, from pediatric and now we got adult populations that probably have more compromise and not sleeping well and increased problems that, can you comment on that anyone? I could comment a little. So, um, you know, we would do work closely with our sleep physicians here. And I know that, you know, here at our sleep center and at other pediatric centers, um, because, you know, they know that this is, is, is a service in high demand and there's, there's so much um, impairment in, in, um, in some of these children, um, the sleep labs in many situations, you know, really employ and train staff to, to work, to create an atmosphere that is, is suitable for these, these patients and can, um, um, uh, you know, help to, to get the data that, that we need. Outside of that, you know, in the adult population, um, there are sometimes home sleep studies. It's, it's really not made its way into the pediatric population as much. Sometimes if we're really up against, you know, um, um, you know, if the sleep lab is really not going to be an option for a patient, sometimes we'll do um, an overnight oximetry study, which can be done at home. Obviously, that's you know, quite limiting. You don't get nearly as much data as you get uh, from that. There's, there is some equipment that can do overnight capnography, which, um, you know, might be an option, but right now it's, it's pretty limited and difficult to get that done in a home setting. So I, I think it's an excellent point. And there's a lot of challenges that remain in this, in this area. Thank you <clears throat> very much. Well, Again, I just want to thank everyone. I want to invite everyone actually to the AADMD um, national meeting that we're going to be having our conference. It's going to be in Orlando, Florida, and it's uh, it's going to be combined actually with the United States uh, Games for Special Olympics. It's coming up on June 3rd to 5th, and we're going to feature sleep disturbance. We'll have a sleep monograph also from the spe uh, sleep specialists in the uh, field of IDD in different areas. And uh, uh, it's going to be a fantastic time. There's 4,500 athletes, uh, Special Olympic athletes, gathered around in, in Orlando, Florida, Disney World, and whatnot. ESPN is one of the major hosts for the United States Games. And if you've never been to a Special Olympics event, this is the one to go to. But right before that is an AADMD Inclusive Health uh, Summit. And we are invited many, many leaders in, in, in the health industry, including uh, the AMA president. Uh, we've invited the Surgeon General. Uh, uh, Dr. Tim Shriver will be there and many others. So stay tuned, look at our website and uh, thank you very much panelists for uh, our excellent presentation. I was screenshotting all of these things but I'm gonna go back and watch the video, but excellent information. I'm gonna turn it back to Cindy and I want to thank uh, Courtney and John for helping in the background and making sure this is running well and Eddie Miola for uh, being part of uh, the organizing team. So Cindy, back to you.
Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you once again, Dr. Schuster, Pickle, and Dr. Harris. We appreciate your um, knowledge and presentation tonight. I personally learned so much as a student. I um, am inspired and I hope to continue to learn and really extend this knowledge for our population of IDD. So thank you guys so much for your time tonight. Take care and we'll see you in all in the new year. Stay well. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you.